first of all, again, it is such a pleasure to be able to connect with you. Like I said earlier, you are a mentor to many and myself included, and I'm appreciative of through my awakening journey, being able to come across your content and feeling like somebody can help guide me through this. My cousin is who put you in my face and was like, this person wow. can help guide you as I was absolutely losing my mind as an awakening. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. I appreciate it. It's great to be on here. I've watched your podcast for some time now, and I was really amazed to have the opportunity to be on this show. So I'm happy. Thank you. Thank you so much for saying that. I appreciate that. Now, um, for for you and your story, I just think it is one of the most transformative, transformative stories I've seen. And I'm ex excited to have you walk us through what that looks like, right? Because we've all experienced trauma in this mm -hmm. lifetime, in this world, on this planet. But for yeah. you to really turn your pain into purpose, I'm, I'm getting to witness that. And so I want to go back to I know your beginning start was a bit in New York. Was New York where you were born? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Queens New York General Hospital, New York. Yep. Okay. Okay. Amazing. And then around six, you moved to Florida. Your mom wanted you guys mm -hmm. to have a little bit more peace in your life coming from a lot that was going <laughs> on. As you talked about, a lot of alcoholism, <laughs> a lot of um, yeah. drugs, but you mm -hmm. laugh because Miami wasn't that. Why do you, yeah. why do you laugh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They went from... Queens, New York, and being in, you know, Jamaica, New York, primarily because it's so close to going straight to like cocaine cowboy heaven in, in Miami. <laughs> um, and in one of the most harshest cities at that time that you can move to. And I was just like scratching my head as a little kid. Like, I don't understand the difference between this and this is worse. Yeah. You know, at least over there, we can get food and everything else. Down here, we had no support, no family, no food. We were eating Cairo syrup and toast, matzo crackers and butter, powdered oh. milk, powdered eggs. You know, uh, whatever anybody can give us, whatever the church would donate to, to, you know, give away food, cans of food and stuff like that. So it was pretty harsh. And like I was saying, you know, at nighttime, sometimes you sleep on the floor in front of a wooden stud that's on the baseboard just so you can prevent yourself from getting shot in the bed at night because bullets would whiz sometimes through the house. We've had bullet holes in the side of the house from gunfights in the neighborhood, neighbors getting killed and murdered right in front of you. You know, it, it was just a nightmare. It was an absolute nightmare. Wow. So around seven, you take in mm -hmm. that information. You've already experienced so much trauma. And at yeah. seven, you said to yourself, okay, no one's coming to save me. I have to save myself. Can you please walk yeah. us through that revelation? Yeah, definitely. I would see my friends going to the ice cream truck daily. And I just wanted to go to the ice cream truck so I can feel like a normal kid. I mean, we're all poor, but they're going every day. And initially, I got a little jealous. I ain't going to lie. I'm like, how can they go to the ice cream truck? Where are they getting this money? And so I looked around. And I said, there's got to be a solution to this. And I just saw all my toys. And I wasn't really a toy kind of kid, believe it or not. I just really wasn't into toys. So I took all the toys and put them in this, uh, this Winn-Dixie milk crate, this plastic milk crate that we had at the house. And I went door to door. I violated my mom's rules about leaving the parameters of the gate in front of the house. And I just went around the whole block. I squared a block, knocking every single door. Sir, ma'am, I'd like to have a donation, a dime, a nickel, a penny, whatever. I'm just trying to sell my toys so that I can have money for the ice cream truck. And I started getting donations. And I had like about $13 and change at the end of the day. And that's when I had the real epiphany, like, wow, if, if there's nobody coming to save me. I'm going to save myself. If I'm going to get out of this neighborhood and out of this situation, which I felt I deserved better, I just knew it in my heart. If I take action like this, if I come up with ideas and take action, I knew I can change my surroundings. Wow, at seven years old. Yeah. <laughs> Where do you go from there? Ah, oh, so far. I mean, that little thought experiment, if you want to call it that, it led me into so many other thought experiments because then I realized the power that I had and I would look around and I would see that people didn't realize that they all had this power to make a decision and then act on it. So many people in my neighborhood, including a lot of my friends, they had already... Uh, succumbed to the environment and already accepted it. And they were like, oh, this is us. This is, you know, this is how we are. This is how it is. And I'd listen to the conversations when you're know, just gathering around, hanging out with friends and stuff like that. And I'm listening like this. This doesn't make any sense to me. I just knew it just didn't sound good. It didn't sound right. And I would, like I said, I would look at TV and I know TV is fake. It's Hollywood. It's acting. It's scripted. But I always thought in my mind that I can achieve some level of peace tranquility and success like what I see on some of the shows I was watching. And so I made a dedication to myself that I would get out of this situation and I would get to that. 
at some point in my life. Mm. And I remember my mother watching me. I was staring out of the window, daydreaming about a better place and a better life. And she said to me, what's wrong, son? And I said, I don't belong here. Mm. <laughs> and she was like, wow. You know, I really hit her hard. I was like, I just don't belong here. I knew it from that early age. And so I began to do thought experiments. And one thing that happened to me a little bit later, which is actually one of the best things that actually ever happened to me, is um, my father called me in a room. I was 12 years old at this time. And he told me that, you know, from this point forward, you're going to have to pay rent to live here $100 a month. I'm not buying you any more school clothes. I was like, well, I only had two pair of pants anyway. (laughs) (laughs) I had two shirts and they were too small already. Mm. Uh, And so I had holes in my shoes. I would put cardboard in my shoes and everything else to keep my feet off the street. But when he told me that, I think an average kid would have crumbled under that kind of pressure. I was like, okay, so what do I got to do? So he handed me this newspaper called the Miami News. And there was a job in there. 12 year old to 16 year olds can go door to door selling newspaper subscriptions for the Miami News. So I took that. I called him. I got the job and a guy would pick us up in a pickup truck after school. You can't do it these days. Right. Seat belt laws and all this kind of stuff. But this is in the 70s. You get get, uh, early 80s, early 80s, get in the back of the pickup truck and go and square a block door to door like I did with my toys selling subscriptions. I became the number one subscription salesperson. Uh, with that little group, that team we had. But where my friends were spending all their money on foolishness, I was saving my money. I only bought one thing. I bought a calculator watch for 1995 from Kmart. And I was sitting in a friend's car. It was actually his dad's car. We were look, we were playing the 8-track. You know, I'm dating myself now. The 8-track <laughs> <the> player. <laughs> the 8-track's only going one direction. Right. You can't rewind the song. Right. So you got to listen to the whole thing. And I told him, I said, one day that's going to change. And I said, also... The dial is going to change to what you see on my watch. These, this digital readout is going to be. And the guy, he, my friend was like, no, man, you're never going to. It's, you're crazy. And I was like, I'm telling you, that's going to be there. That same afternoon, my mother sent me to the grocery store to uh, get something from the store, from Winn-Dixie grocery store. And I go in and I go to the magazine rack first. I hang out at magazine racks all the time. And this one magazine I couldn't reach before, it was way at the top, was finally down in the area where the comic books and stuff were. It was called Opportunity. And I always wanted to read what was inside of it. I opened it up. And as I opened it, it was almost like page dowsing. As soon as I opened it, it opened up to Galaxy Electronics, a company based out of New York, New York, still in business till this day. They were a wholesaler of electronic uh, components. And they had just come out with digital car stereos, just like I told my friend was going to be on, you know, in all cars eventually. And you can buy them wholesale. They were only like 25 bucks a piece back then. Mm. And I was like, I got some money. So I called up the company and I placed to order COD cash on delivery. And I don't know if I ordered like 70 or 80 of them at the first, the first order I took. And the guy was like, you sound like a kid. I said, no, no, no. I'm just getting over a cold. <laughs> he had nothing to lose because it was COD. <laughs> so back then, cash on delivery, you can't lose. Right. UPS would just bring it back if, the, if they didn't have the money. Right. They'd probably have to pay a small re, reshipping fee. They came. I paid the UPS man his cash. I got my radios. And I went to all the upperclassmen and high schoolers. And I sold those things in just a couple of days. And then word got out that I had these digital stereos. And then people would come from tri-county areas to my house to buy these stereos. It turned into a booming electronics business. I started doing speakers and subwoofers and six by nines and amps and EQ boosters and and all this kind of stuff. And it just became huge. I even got a kid who used to do installations at the local store to come work for me and install it right in front of my house. So and nobody could beat my prices. So by the time I was 13, I was earning more than my parents. Uh, And it just kept I just kept accelerating from there. You know, I even got my mother into her own company because she fell down and won a lawsuit for five thousand dollars. I remember in that same magazine, there was a company that had a carpet cleaning machine for $5,000, a special type of carpet cleaning machine. It didn't use water. It used dry foam extraction. It was called the Von Schrader Dry Foam Extraction Carpet Cleaning and Upholstery Machine. It was $4,999. I said, Mom, if you listen to me, you'll make more money than you ever made in your life. And all she did was deliver newspapers for a living. Her and my dad, that's what they did. They make like 10 grand a year. And so she listened to me. She said, well, how am I going to get the clients? I said, you deliver papers, put a flyer in every paper and then deliver it to your customers. They're going to call you and you're going to have appointments. And that's exactly what happened. And the first year they made 70,000. The second year they made 120,000. The third year, I don't really know what they made. But by the fourth year, unfortunately, my father had gotten so wigged out on drugs and everything else. He screwed up a lot of the clients. But 
they had a good little run there, you know, when she listened to what I told her. And I just knew then my mind was very powerful and that I knew I saw things that people didn't see. And so I would just, you know, I became a serial entrepreneur and I was able to take care of myself, run two companies, graduate from high school, move out on my own at 16. And I just kept, I never looked back. Billy, what a story. What a story. <laughs> There's so many parts I want to address. One thing that really is enlightening to me is, is how you talk about the power of thought and the power of mind, but you weren't afraid about, of your power. You weren't afraid mm -hmm. of what you were experiencing, right? Because I mean, sometimes we, we have these big ideas and then we say, mm -hmm. mm, but how can I, and when would that happen? Right. And what would it really take? Right. But you weren't afraid yeah. of that. So why do you think first, why do you think we are afraid of the power of our thoughts? Why do you think we're afraid of what we see? Cause all of us have a version of seeing something, but most yeah. of us shut it down. Right. I think we shut it down. What shuts it down is the programming code in your body, the programming code of epigenetic memories of, of, of your ancestors. We know we have 15 to 20 years of memories in our bodies from ancestors. And typically those are torturous, uh, low, low frequency memories. So those memories kick in and tell you, no, you can't as do in, it. No, as in we're fail. born with them. As in we're born, yeah, we're born with them. Yeah. Oh. This is now scientifically been proving mm -hmm. epigenetics is a huge, huge thing now. They discovered that traumas from 15 to 20 generations of your past ancestors gets passed down through the RNA, down the father's bloodline. And when you're born, you're born with memories from 15 to 20 generations ago that are active in your life as you're growing up and living. And people can't figure out, why do I feel depressed? I got a great life. Why am I feeling angry or anxious? A lot of the times, those are memories that are coming out through your genes. It's gene expressions that are creating different hormonal uh, levels in your body that's creating the different moods that you're getting into. You have to learn how to reprogram those epigenetics. Mm. And then we have the programming, TV programming and the radio programming and the school and system programming. And a lot of that programming tells you you can't be more than, you can't excel or exceed past your programming code. Like in the third grade, my teacher told everybody to stand up and say what you want to be for a living. This is at Rainbow Park Elementary in uh, Opelika. And everybody stood up and I want to be a janitor. I want to be a garbage man. I want to be a school teacher. I want to be a police officer. I jumped up with excitement and said, I want to be famous and I want to be on TV. And the teacher just asked me right there. Oh, Billy, you'll never be famous and be on TV. Look where you come from. You're poor. Pick something else. And the whole class laughed at me mm. and they laughed. And I was so embarrassed. I even cried. It was so heart wrenching, you know, but I didn't even let that tear me down. I said, you know what? I'm going to dedicate my life to proving this lady wrong. And, and exactly what I've done. I mean, I'm now I'm on thousands of TV shows, but <laughs> <laughs> right. But, but I think a lot of people's programming code, it not, but for an average person, what happened to me would have shut them down for life. But for some reason, which I can't you really don't know that reason? Out, I don't know. I went to Dr. Amon, who's a, the number one psychiatrist in the world. He did a spec scan of my brain. Yes. I he saw a trauma that. pattern in my brain. He read me, he read my life like a book looking at my brain. He knew about my trauma, but he said, I didn't develop PTSD. I developed something called PTG, which is called post-traumatic growth. And he said like one in a hundred thousand people or less develop this PTG where mm -hmm. I didn't take the victim mindset. I saw the trauma and pushed it in towards my passion. And I, you know, I out, 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 out did my programming code. And so that's what happened to me. And I, for whatever reason, I just never had that fear of trying new things and trying to become successful at whatever I did. Amazing. So I know this is a big question, but if we're all born with this thing that we quote unquote cannot control, how on earth can we get rid of it? If we just heard that information right now, what, what do we right. do next? So that's a great question. See, the, the only way to solve problems within your mind and your consciousness is to bring awareness to it. If you don't know that it exists, you can't even begin to solve it. There was a gentleman who uh, was diagnosed with cancer and it was terminal cancer. He got into a car accident and he uh, had amnesia. And uh, because he had amnesia, he forgot he had cancer and the cancer went away. <laughs> so the <laughs> wow. mind is powerful in both ways, yeah. right? So now imagine you discover you have this issue that's going on in your gene expressions and your DNA and now you bring awareness to it. So now you go, oh, this could be some of the reasons why I'm acting out or doing this or doing that. Now, how do I fix it? Great question. The first thing you have to do is realize that scientists did extensive studies into speaking positive affirmations over your own life. They've done extent. These, these have been done millions of times. It's not like a few times here or there. And they discovered 
that speaking out loud positive affirmations about yourself for 21 days straight, speaking three to six times a day, speaking over your own life in 21 days, your DNA begins to rewrite its own code. You can rewrite your own DNA. Mm -hmm. And so that's just the beginning part. So journaling, writing, uh, writing down your affirmations, speaking your affirmations, that begins the process of changing the way that you your, your body is expressing genes. You can turn genes off just through actual speaking of affirmations. Mm. And then when you get into a situation when you re realize an old emotion that doesn't fit with the situation is coming up, you have to check yourself and catch yourself and then send your brain to think of something positive. Think of something great. Think of a blessing that you have. Think of something that's good going on in your life or think of previous things that are great in your life. For just 15 to 20 seconds, it turns off the negativity and puts on positivity. And then you move forward in that direction. It's called brain heart coherence. So these little tips and tricks, which I teach all the time, give people the capability of maintaining their brain heart coherence, moving forward in the right direction and bypassing a lot of negative thoughts. Like uh, Dr. Amon calls them ants, automatic negative thoughts. Hmm. What's the difference between positive thoughts, writing what you want down, and trying to control, right? For for instance, right now I'm in a space where I'm looking for love. I'm so excited about love. And I'm very, mm -hmm. I have a lot of friends and a lot of people, a lot of people I love to study, they'll say, write down exactly what you want. And I'll think, okay, I'm writing it down. And then I'll look and say, is this too high expectations? Is this too detailed? Am I being too controlling? Like I'm thinking mm -hmm. about that, but I'm also saying, but I was told to manifest in this way. So right. that's just a very specific example. But what is the difference when we say, express positive information, write it all down mm -hmm. versus like you're trying to write your own story or do we, act, we have the power to write our own story and how do we know when yeah. we're doing it right or wrong, right or wrong or, you know, subjective. But I think you have the power to write your own story. And I think when you're writing down your affirmations, if, if it's going to be, uh, you know, trying to meet somebody uh, for a relationship that is the person of your dreams and what you would like to see in that person, I believe totally 100%. You should write down everything mm. that you think that you want and deserve. Mm. Because if you don't, I think you're opening up, opening up yourself for failure. I'd rather have more and get a little bit less than not enough and manifest somebody that's even lower than that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yes. so there's levels to how it comes in. So you yeah. may not get everything on the list, but you can get the majority of things on that list. Yeah. But then also recognizing that that person may have some requirements of you and they're just a two-way process sure. and then it's going to take a little bit of give and take on both sides to make it work sure. but i definitely would write down everything sure. and i like writing pen to paper is really the best way to do things yeah thank you for answering that that was a personal question hopefully anybody else can relate <laughs> but with that you also go back when we talk about positive affirmations 15 seconds 21 days when we talk about some of those things for me, it leads to the conversation about the penile gland, about our third mm -hmm. eye, right? I yeah. was so enamored when I became, went through or have begun my awakening process, just to give you a little mm -hmm. bit of background on me. I was raised in a Christian home for mm -hmm. a long time. That was the programming I was under. And it mm -hmm. took probably up until maybe three years ago where that started to break really harshly, mm -hmm. especially when you're in yeah. your late twenties, early thirties, and you're like, what yeah. is happening? Um, yeah. And that led me to a level of spirituality that I am still obviously uncovering and revealing and constantly trying to, you know, understand. But I will say there are times that I have like you said beautifully earlier, when you don't know that a problem exists, you, mm -hmm. you know, you're just under that programming. So some yeah. of the new problems that I find out exist, I get a little overwhelmed by trying to figure out that problem. And one of them was learning so deeply about my penile gland and about my mm. third eye and about how mad I was that it had been hidden from me and how <laughs> mad I was that the fluoride was my too how mad. I mean, I was just, I went through such a crazy, you yeah. know, um, process in that. So my first question is, how do we learn about some of the problems that we are that are that we're under or some mm -hmm. of the things that we are blinded by and mm -hmm. not be overwhelmed and consumed by it and go into yeah. solution oriented mode that's my first part of the question yeah you know one of the greatest ways to figure out more and learn more about yourself is to use self-help books self-help videos a lot of the times you have an idea of certain things but not fully not, not a full understanding of them. And so sometimes these self-help books, self-help videos and stuff like that, you know, psychotherapy shows and so forth, 
will help you reflect more on yourself and bring out what the issues are to the top of your mind. And then you'll have an epiphany and realize, oh, this is why that, oh, this is why this is happening. And then from there, a lot of the times they provide solutions and or different techniques or ways to help you get out of that. Uh, you know, so some of the things you can use are modalities. Modalities are amazing. Uh, there's a lot of modalities. It's a way of, of interjecting different type of technology or tapping techniques into your daily life to trigger ways to get your mind to focus and, and fire differently so you can get out of those moods or situations. One of the greatest ones that I've seen so far has been grounding, mm. uh, grounding with the earth. Mm. Also, um, using this brain training uh, device. It's a brain training device that connects to your scalp and it literally begins to create a mirror for 20, you think it's 30, 20 or 30 minutes. It creates a mirror of your mind when you're in this uh, meditative state and you put on the, the, ear, the headsets and it plays this meditation music, but it has skips and interruptions in it. Those skips and interruptions are your brain waves correcting themselves. Mm. It's a way of you getting your mind to correct itself without you even fully, totally being aware of it. It's an amazing device. Uh, Neuro Optimal is what it's called. Say it again. Sorry, I spoke over Yeah, Neuro Optimal mm -hmm. is the name of that device. It's a great device to use. If you can't afford one, people who are listening, they're about 15000 But there's a lot of practitioners who have that device at their mental health facilities. And you can go and pay a small fee, you know, a few times a month and you can use it that way. Mm. Um, you know, so just various different types of techniques. And then I also recommend that people do go to like Amen clinics where I went mm -hmm. uh, because they have them all over the country and you get a SPECT scan. A SPECT scan is amazing because it's going to show you everything going on in your brain that you wouldn't have known about. You know, if you have a broken bone, you go to the doctor, they're going to do an x-ray. If you have a torn ligament, you go to the doctor, they're going to do an, an MRI. If you have a, something wrong emotionally with you mentally, you, walk, you go to the doctor, they give you a prescription medication. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't even look at the problem. But almond clinics, they say, okay, you, this is what you're experiencing. Come back here with us. We're going to do a spec scan. You're going to analyze the brain. And when I got my spec scan, I always had a, a, a very poor sense of direction. My Achilles heel was my sense of direction. That's the only thing I really had that was really bad. I didn't know how to even, when I come out of an elevator, I'd get lost. Mm. I lose my car in parking lots and everything else. And it was because of a brain injury I had in a car accident that I was in. That's why I have this scar over this eye. I went through a windshield mm. when I was 21. And so he showed me that I had two, developed two big dimples about the size of silver dollars on the top of my brain, right where the navigation center is. And so I think I'm just like getting old or I can't understand why I don't know where I'm going. Mm. I'm getting lost in my neighborhood. But it wasn't because, uh, you know, I was getting I'm getting old. <laughs> it's because I had something wrong with my brain. Yeah. And so I was able to now bring awareness to that. And he gave me this regimen of brain supplements and activities to do to exercise both sides of my brain. And then nine months later, I went back, which was just about two months ago, got my second spec scan. And guess what? They're gone. And my navigation ability is back. It came back oh about gosh. four months ago fully. I don't get lost anymore. Yeah. And so I thought it was just something with naturally with age. And I'm thinking, boy, when I get older, I'm going to be out in big trouble. I won't know where I'm going. I won't know what city I'm in or anything. But it was those dimples from that accident. I would have never known. But he brought awareness to it. That spec scan for me was huge. So I recommend if you can do it, go get a spec scan from Almond Clinics. That's an incredible suggestion. I hope to also be joining you in that. Can we mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about the penile gland? I'm yes, really... Absolutely really intrigued by your way of breaking it down. And I would love to first start with the functionality of the pineal gland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the pineal gland is this little tiny P-shaped object inside, deep, deep, deep inside the brain. In mm -hmm. most cases, a lot of people represent it up here as the third eye. Mm -hmm. But in true reality, it's not in the front. It's way deep in the center of the brain, near the, the thalamus and everything else. But it is been, it's been known since deep, deep antiquity, super ancient times, which makes you question how in the world did they know that this thing was an eye? In other words, it has photoreceptors. Now, you would have to be able to, uh, first of all, do an autopsy on somebody, take it out, and then analyze it to see you know, what it, capabilities it even has. So they had some technology, I'm just saying. <laughs> but they knew that this thing had the capability of uh, receiving photons and light waves and then channeling it throughout the body, which is pretty interesting. Also, the third eye, it has these hairs on it, which are like receiving antennas. 
because it's your spiritual antenna, it's your connection to the higher dimensions that exist. Mm -hmm. We know that this universe has uh, 11 dimensions based on string theory. And what's interesting in 2022, a new scientific study came out. They just discovered that the human mind can exist and perceive up to 11 dimensions, the same amount as the universe. So we know now, now know that our mind is a fractal of the whole, and this is peer-reviewed quantum physics. So it's not like off the top of my dome, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and But that has primarily to do with the third eye. It's also made of crystals. There's crystal in there. And crystals have an amazing power. When you put pressure on a crystal, it releases energy. That's what's inside of a lighter. If you have a big lighter, when you spark the lighter, that's not a, flick, that's not a flint in there or some type of kindle. That's actually a, a, a crystal inside the big lighter. You put pressure on it, it sparks. When you put the pressure of the uh, spinal fluid on the pineal gland, it sparks. You can actually transmit, you can push the fluid up your spine into that area and put pressure, it'll spark. When it sparks, it releases DMT. Mm. And through breath work, you can create the same ex experience as taking ayahuasca which is why I'm a big believer in breathwork meditations. Yeah. You can have your own DMT. You don't have to take it from a plant and have somebody out in the jungle somewhere. You don't even know if they're going to take advantage of you because it's happened to a lot of people. Sure. You can do it in the privacy of your own home, watching a breathwork video with a guided meditation, and you can trigger the same exact response through a breathwork meditation as taking ayahuasca. But it's so amazing because it allows you to reach higher levels of dimensions and consciousness within your same body, uh, and it, it's just really gives you a perception that you normally wouldn't have. When you tap into understanding how the third eye works, it's almost like wave, waves of water crash on you when you're in the ocean, if you're just standing still. So the average person is like, a, like, is like a person standing in the ocean with the wave crashing over them. And when the wave crashes, that's when they realize, oh, this moment just happened. Mm -hmm. But when you're operating from your third eye, you're surfing on the wave. So you're closer to real time information. Because scientists discovered that there's a seven to eight second delay in between the time that something happens and the time that we realize it happens. Mm. They did this amazing scientific study where they put people in different rooms, dark rooms with TVs and electrodes, EEG connected to their brain, connected to computers. Originally, this, uh, this experiment was simply to do one thing and one thing only. See what the brain looked like based on certain emotions. So every 10 seconds, they would show a different image, a woman coddling a baby, a, a bed of flowers, somebody getting murdered, a car accident. So it was flipping back and forth between tragic and peace. What started happening in every case study is this. The brain started transmitting to the computer seven to eight seconds ahead of time what the next image was going to be. Mm. And they realized something. Wait a minute. The brain has already experienced. Consciousness has already experienced what's happening. It took us in this corporeal body, seven to eight seconds to actually realize it for it to be now current time. So they realize there's this delay between information that exists and the human body processing it and it being um, us being made aware of it. So everything that we see going on around us is seven to eight seconds delayed unless you're moving from the third eye, the, the pineal gland. When you tap into that and you, you bring awareness to it, your intuition skyrockets and intuition turns you into a surfer versus a person that's standing in the ocean waiting for the wave to crash over them. Okay, guys, I'm going to take us there. Let's, let's go back. <laughs> wow. Really? What an incredible description. Now it first brings me to when, when was your penal gland activated? This is my first time. So I was eight years old and this is, this is now, I don't know if this exactly was it, but I remember it ate something miraculous happened to me. We were at the laundry mat. They call it a wash house, right in Miami. No window, I mean, yeah, no no glass windows, just an open frame, no air conditioning, piping hot in the middle of summer doing laundry, and uh, you know, it'd be like 110 degree off the pavement, the heat bouncing back up, and I was so hot because I had just got done folding clothes out of the dryer, and I sat on the curb in front of that laundry mat, and I said, man, I wonder if I could take myself or send my mind to another place where it's cold. So I sat on the curb. I never heard of meditation. I sat on the curb and I closed my eyes and I said, I'm going to send my mind to Alaska. I knew it was cold in Alaska. I knew about Eskimos and so forth. So I sent my mind to Alaska for about 15 to 20 minutes. I really felt that I was really there. And when I came to, my skin was cool to the touch. And I knew 
I was like, oh, wow, something incredible just happened. That's when I knew there was so much more. And I, start, I started doing more of these thought experiments and I realized, wow, I can get into these meditations and I can even see geometric shapes and figures. And I just started doing it over and over again. It wasn't until I would say probably 10 years old when I read the first book about meditation where I realized that I was doing meditation. I was just calling them thought experiments. Wow. Um, how has our reality, if we speak on the reality we're currently in, let's say that we, you know, how has our current reality tried to distance us from the third eye? Oh, it's trying to completely keep us disconnected. So the first thing that is, is toxins. So we are drinking a lot of fluoridated water. We have microplastics in the water bottles, microplastics in the air, microplastics in our food. Everything that we eat has been absorbing the microplastics out of the earth, and then you cook it and you eat it. So we're having uh, all of our hormone disruptors that we're taking in, which is also calcifying the pineal gland. All these things are all this toxicity that we're taking in, all the pharmaceuticals that we're taking in, uh, and all the negativity that we're taking if you're a person that's addicted to watching the news and all those things. So scientists discovered that the pineal gland is the most susceptible tissue in the body for calcification. Mm. So the more of that happens, the more toxicity you take in and absorb consistently, the more calcified or disconnected the pineal gland becomes. And so that's one of the reasons why people are walking around just like zombies, just working on programming code. I call them soulless avatars operating on matrix programming. You see them everywhere you go, like zombies. They don't really even realize that they're alive. They're alive, but they're not living. And so, uh, you know, you have to get beyond that. But it takes awareness, which is a big part of what you do. What I do is trying to bring awareness to people that there's more out there than what you think. And if you can just focus on it for a period of time you'll realize your brain will begin to start to ask questions. And if you follow those questions, you'll begin to find answers and that will start to change the way that you think. How are a few ways? I mean, I'm not the one that's like top three, top five, but just in hearing that how many toxins we take in and how much the pineal gland takes in, what are a few ways we can detox, like detox our pineal gland? Like if somebody's mm -hmm. hearing you right now, that is a huge amount right. of awareness. What can they do tomorrow? The first thing is, is your water. You must drink unfluoridated water. Your water, most water, especially tap water has fluoride in it. Uh, mm. You go to a restaurant, you say, I'll have a glass of water. That's fluoridated water. Everywhere you go, they're giving you that fluoridated water. Uh, some bottled waters also have fluoride in them. So you have to be careful what bottled waters you get. What are your favorite, what drink. are your favorite bottled waters? If you even drink bottled water. Yeah, I do sometimes. Saratoga is great and Mountain is great. Those two. Uh, Fiji is also pretty good. So okay. those are the top three bottled waters that I drink. The first two I named, Saratoga and, and Mountain, come in glass bottles, which I love mm -hmm. because you get away from plastic that way. Mm -hmm. Fiji, unfortunately, does come in plastic, uh, but you want to make sure you don't leave your bottled water in your car in a hot summer. When you leave bottled water in a car or somewhere where it's hot, the BPAs, which was petroleum, leached from the plastic into the water, and then you drink the water. And they did studies, extensive studies on this now. It's been now mainstream news that drinking bottled water stored in your hot car will give you cancer. Ooh. So you think you're doing something healthy and you're still killing yourself. So get away from the fluoride and get a, um, a water filtration system for your house. If you can't afford that, try to at least uh, get a filtration system for each, for each faucet. One for your shower head and one for your drinking water if you're not buying bottled water. Because when you take a shower, your skin is taking in, your skin as an organ is taking in about 40 to 50% of whatever's in that water. Mm. So we know that in the water is fluoride, pharmaceuticals, now high levels of pharmaceuticals, and other toxins, including microplastics. So when you go and take a shower, you now put all that on your body, and then you come out of the shower, and a few minutes later, you start to feel weird. Why? It's because you've just poisoned yourself with pharmaceuticals. You, it's absorbed into the body, into the bloodstream. And now you've just given yourself everybody, everyone's in the neighborhood's prescription medication. Oh, so, God. And then you can't boil water. Don't boil your water. Some people try to shortcut boiling water. Boiling water is worse than drinking the tap water. Because if you remember from chemistry class, or some people probably didn't study this, but when you boil water with fluoride in it, the fluoride converts into fluorine and becomes 10 times more toxic for the body. It's a neurotoxin at that point because the molecules shift. 
So you don't want to ever drink boiled water. That's the worst thing you can ever do unless it's an tap water. emergency. Yeah, no okay, boiled tap, tap water. water. That's what you mean. Okay. So yeah, somebody's using like their water. water bottle and putting their water bottle in in you know um, in a pot to boil, or if they're using their filter water, are those things a bit better? That's better. Those are better. Yeah, that's better. If you're cooking, like people like to cook with water from the sink. Mm-hmm. For some reason, they don't make the connection. If I put this water from the tap, oh, I'm cooking it. It's going to be boiling. That's going to make it better anyway. What they're doing is they're making a toxic soup. So you don't want to like put your spaghetti in a pot of water from your sink and boil it. You just created flor- fluorine and now you're boiling your, your spaghetti in fluorine. No good. Brain toxin. Where do you suggest people get these filters that you're saying for their sink and their shower? There's a couple of places. Amazon has some pretty good ones. You want to look for uh, filters that filter out fluoride and pharmaceuticals and uh, bacteria and viruses. Those will be a little bit more expensive than just the basic filter, sure. but it's worth it to make sure that you're putting in, your body is made of 70 to 80% water. Mm. So you want to be putting in clean, fresh water into the body to rejuvenate your shells, cells and your mitochondria. And so one of the biggest things you can do to detox your pineal gland is just drinking a lot of fresh, clean water that's, that's not fluoridated, that's not toxic. And, you know, and then the other way is to uh, eat clean, don't eat a lot of processed foods get exercise and meditation is another great way to keep the pineal gland activated, specifically breath work meditations. I have a lot of breath work meditation. I think they have three, three, two hour breath work meditations on forbidden knowledge TV that people can go and watch. Excellent. It's, it's so tough because as you said, as we, as we experience, and again, part of my awakening, that was so, sh- you know, you start throwing away your Colgate and freaking out about your crest. And it's just, it's just, it's so, <laughs> you're just, I know. you're just trying, you're like, can I drink this coconut water? Is coconut water? Like, I don't even know. You go through the thing. And yeah. uh, for those who are in that process or learning about this process, if you've done something for so long, let's say 20 years of drinking one thing, if you switch tomorrow, I mean, my, my fear now that I'm out of that fear, but at the time I was like, is anything going to change? And I've already built up so much toxins. Can this just, you know, change overnight? What would you say to people who are thinking that, or even trying to figure out how to get in the habit of making these changes as we are in a nation that makes sure that we stay busy, we stay distracted, Mm -hmm. we stay confused, we stay Mm -hmm. stressed. Even when they say they don't want that, they're lying. So (laughs) how would you say to them? Yeah, I would say it's never too late. Remember, the human Mm -hmm. body exchanges every single cell in your body every six years. And so just start from the day you find out and bring awareness to it. Begin to start, you know, begin the start of the the decalcification process and the detoxing process. And just try to stay true to yourself and make conscious decisions on what you're putting into your body. If you think of it this way, you've now put everything in your body that shouldn't have been there. All right. And so you you ate for entertainment and fun. Now it's time to eat to live. So just make that switch to now eat to live, eat to better yourself, eat to raise your awareness, eat to raise your raise your consciousness. And if you think from that perspective and start today, knowing that in a very short period of time, your body can be detoxed and you're going to become more clear, more concise. Your decision making ability is going to become better. Your knowledge is going to become better. Your health is going to become better. And so it's, I don't think it's ever too late to start to change the way that we treat our bodies. That's amazing. I was just going to ask, like, how does somebody know when their penile gland is on the right path of being detox? Like, how, what would mm-hmm. they feel? What would they experience? How will they know? Well, you're going to start to realize that their voice that they're hearing inside of their head is changing. It's morphing. In other words, people hear this voice in their head a lot of the time for whatever reason. I don't know why. It's the programming we've been given growing up. It's a man's voice. Uh, But it's not even if you're a man, it's not your voice. It's a man's voice, but it's some other man's voice. Right. And it's always this man's voice. And and he is giving me and him. He. But as you begin to awaken your pineal gland, that voice changes into your own voice. When you begin to hear your own voice in your head and not some other entity's voice, that's when you get into a serious high level. Uh, When your meditations become more productive, in other words, when you come out of your meditation, you begin to see the manifestations of the work that you're doing within yourself. When your surroundings around you begin to change, you know, when you become more orderly, when your uh, house is in a wreck and a mess and everything is filthy, dirty and dusty and dishes are piled up and all this other kind of, when you begin to see that goes little slight change, you start making up your bed. Simple things Mm. will start to let you know that 
something's changing about you when your decision making abilities when you versus you used to say i'll do this and do that knowing that it's going to cause you heartache or prom or problems the next day like maybe drinking or something like that and you say no i'm not going to do that and now you realize wow the benefits of not doing that and you see you know where you're growing and how you're becoming a better person and then you can look back on your previous self yeah. and see that you were here and now you're here and the stage is going up and every time you look back and see that you've risen to another level, that's when you're born again. Being born again has nothing to do with getting doused in a water, a lake, or a pot of water. It has to do with uh, realizing that you've achieved a higher level of consciousness. That's when you've been born again. And you'll be born again many times in one lifetime. Oh, say that again. That is so good. <laughs> that is that is the true that is honestly what gave me a level of appreciation and passion for life. I've always had such a rich appreciation for life, but to find out you can be a whole other person in the same lifetime, like to mm -hmm. find out I was Stacy, the Christian girl who was raised in this way in the yeah. South and this understanding and this, and then to even have the, the want and the desire to just completely try something different. I, I didn't even know that was yeah. possible at the time. And yeah. that's why I'm so excited to talk to someone like you and to invite this information because it's like, I know we assume that based on what we've experienced is like, how else can we change? We've done this for so long. We've been in a certain, pro but there are, you can literally just switch it up. Like that is the, that yeah. is life. Yeah. yeah. It's just a decision. Yeah. See, when you become the observer of your thoughts, that's when your life begins to change. Right now, a lot of people believe that they are their thoughts mm -hmm. and the thoughts control them. When you can distinguish and separate yourself from the thoughts and observe the thoughts, and then you can reprogram the thoughts that's when you're making some serious progress. Yeah. You've talked about meditation a few times and I want, how do you suggest people like approach meditation? Because we talk about it so much. There's a lot of mm -hmm. things that, you yeah. know, people now uh, identify as woo woo. I know meditation is extremely important in my life and yeah. I'm continuing to learn more about it, but how would you, mm -hmm. you know, show people to approach meditation either for the first time or if they're reapproaching yeah. it? Well, a lot of people, the reason why they don't meditate a lot is because they can't get their mind quiet. That's the hardest part for a lot of people because we've had so much stimulus going on and the sure. brain is always looking for another dopamine hit. It's looking, looking, looking nonstop. So all of a sudden you try to stop and calm down and the brain is still going, no, give me, give me, give me, give me. I want something. Right. Yeah. And so that's the biggest problem. So people get frustrated and they stop or they do it when it's too, you know, it's so late at night or something and they fall asleep. And so they're not able to clear their mind. So I just recommend that a person prepares themselves mentally going into a meditation, knowing that. I'm getting ready to work on myself mm -hmm. and they go into a nice quiet place if they have one. And then the first thing you want to do, I see a bowl in my mind. That's my biggest thing. I see the bowl. That's how I got into my first groups of meditations where I was really making significant progress going into extended periods of time. And in that bowl, all my thoughts are there. So I actually envision all of my thoughts in the bowl and I see a hand from the outside coming in and lifting up thoughts and taking them out, lifting up thoughts. And as they're taking the thoughts out, my mind is literally getting more quiet and more quiet and more quiet until almost all the thoughts are gone. Now, they can't get all the for some reason, I've never got an empty bowl, <laughs> but the majority of those thoughts, they're gone. Yeah. And then I envision that the cosmic energy is filling up that bowl. So now it's being filled with this light. And those meditations for me can an hour can feel like five minutes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and I recommend listening to 432 Hertz music yes. because it's a very special frequency that resonates with the human body. And uh, it'll help you get into those those transcendental states a lot faster and easier as well. And I would just say start out working your way up. I would start out with five minutes, then 10 minutes then 15 minutes. And after you get to about 20 minutes, then I wouldn't focus on time anymore. I would just let yourself go until your body comes out of the meditation naturally. Yes, I want to definitely reiterate the 432 hertz, y'all. That is such an important yeah. part of the meditation. You talk a yeah. lot about, even on your channel, when you're giving information, you say, but do your own research. Go do your own research. Let's talk about yeah. research. Because I know you mm -hmm. do not mean Google, Billy. So what do you really <laughs> mean when you say, because I'm always, this is something I'm always, even with myself, when I'm like, I, right now, as we're talking, I had really bad chest pains yesterday, right? And I was mm -hmm. like, Stace, don't call anyone, try to research. But I was very discouraged mm -hmm. because 
I went to Google first and Google said yeah. terrible things like take antidepressants. Oh, and I was like, <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm like, you know, and I, I finally settled on hibiscus tea because it would like for, it's good mm-hmm. for blood. And I was like, maybe my blood mm-hmm. blows off. So I, I tried to really yeah. sit with myself to take a second, but imagine somebody doesn't have a second, not that we don't, but you know, you, mm-hmm. we hear research so often and we go yeah. to what has been shown to us, but we know Google and all these other places are not giving us the depth of research. So where do mm-hmm. you research and how do you suggest people do that? Yeah. I mean, Google is just for quick ideas or concepts and it can get you started right. on a path. But if something really serious that's your, that you really need to know a lot about, I recommend books, you know, books are the best. I have over a thousand books in this house, mm-hmm. you know, and so I have, you know, different types of medical books. I have homeopathic, homeopathic medicine books, naturopathic books, if, it's, if you're talking health. Mm. So those are like encyclopedia type books. I can go to those books. I know I can find something there that c- I could potentially tap into that's going to help me out. And then I have books on so many topics. It's like, you know, <laughs> mind blowing. I but I just know that books for me, uh, if I go to one book and I get some information, then I'll find another book on the, sim- on the same topic from a different author and see what they have to say. So now I'm getting opinions from two different authors that are now considered experts in their field because they've written a book. And so I'm trying to go after top authors that have similar stories or similar information about different topics, the same topic, but different um, expressions of it. And then I can come up with my own hypothesis after looking for some of the source material. So once I see what they're talking about and I track down the sources, then I'll go to the sources, whether it's ancient Sumerian tablets or whether it's a particular other a, a papyrus, a papyrus text or a, a cylinder scroll or maybe some medical journal, but then I'll go and analyze that information. So now I've got these two or three opinions from authors. I've got the source material where they also came up with their hypothesis, and now it gives me enough to paint my own picture. Sure. Do you feel like it's possible for us to, as a collective consciousness, not be affected by society? I'm in air quotes, guys, society. Do you think that's possible? (laughs) Oh, it's definitely possible, yeah. It's just up to the power of your own mind. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, every four years I go down to the voting line to vote for a president, but I don't vote for the presidents that are running for office. I write my own name on the ballot and put my own name inside the box because I am the president. Every four years, I renew my presidency over my own life. Oh, my God. Do you seriously do that? Oh, yeah, I do it. And then I post my ballot online. (laughs) <laughs> what do people say in response? Because I can already, I can hear two sides. One person saying, oh my God, I love it. And the other person saying, you're wasting a vote. Like, what do yeah. you say to that? That is so but great. You, you're crazy. And some people yeah. say, well, now they're starting to say, we want you to be the president for real. Now, that, that was years ago. Literally. But now they're saying, oh, we want you to be able to be the president <laughs> for real. Like, can you really be the president? <laughs> that is why I'm smiling right now. I'm like, wait, you really yeah. do that? Wait, can we collect those? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going back again. I'm going to go back in line again and stand it in line. When I get to the front, I'm taking a blank ballot and put my name on it. I'm reaffirming my own presidency every four years. That's what I do because I'm the president of my life and my family. And that's how I live my life. I don't care who's in that poly tricksters office. I don't care about congresswomen and senators. I don't care about none of those people and presidents. So all I care about is the decisions that I make and what I can control and how I mold and shape my reality tunnel. Mm. Sharks are going to do what sharks do. Mm. I can't get mad at a shark. A shark is going to smell blood. They're going to attack. They're doing, these people are doing what they're born to do. Mm. Okay. Mm. And it's only about a hundred or so of them controlling 8 billion people. It's really shame on us at the end of the day. We're the ones that's allowing all this craziness to happen. Mm. If everyone would go down to the box and put their own name on the thing and put it in, then what would happen? Imagine, (laughs) imagine, imagine. So they have us thinking that, you know, that they that, you know, that we work for them and we have to listen to them. In actuality, we we're supposed to make the rules and they're supposed to be working for us. We're paying them to work for us. But they flip the script on us and they've got us thinking that it's the opposite way around. Mm. And so I just take this whole my whole life is all about breaking the mold, walking on the gray, you know, living my own life as my own king and my own um, my own president and making my own decisions. You You know, that's how I live. How does your way of living affect the relationships around you and romantically and platonically? Well, you know, it's been tr- it's been tough. I mean, I've been through divorces. Uh, I've been married a few times already um, and uh, I'm engaged now again. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm still having given up on life. I'm engaged. I found somebody that thinks like I think. Sure. I kept fighting this uphill battle, you know, um, getting involved with people that didn't have the full vision that I had. And so I kept realizing that I was also getting with people that were more on the side of taking. 
And I read this one book that said, you know, because I'm trying to figure out why am I keep ending up in this situation? And I found out I, I'm a giver. I'm a big giver. But when givers and takers get in a relationship, you know, we have you always have a problem and they always end up a giver always finds a taker. So I said, I got to I got to change the mold. I need to find a giver. So I went and found a giver. Mm. And so now I'm with a giver and I see, wow, the mindset's totally different. And we have the same passion. We have the same vision. So we're walk, working towards the same goal. Whereas in the other relationships, everybody had their own thing going on. They really didn't believe in anything that I believed in or even the path that I was on. And so they were doomed to fail anyway. And so, you know, that's one of the hardest things to do is to find somebody with the same vision you have. And I work a lot. I'm a hard worker. I'm passionate about what I do. So whoever gets involved with me has to be willing to work a lot as well. I'm going to make carve out time for QT, but at the same time, you know, I might put in 15 hours for the next three or four days straight, you know? So, and then somebody has to understand that. Sure. Sure. We are, in my recollection, in my opinion, we are in a time where there was a war on love and there's a war on self. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. There's a big time war on that. I mean, they're hypersexualizing everything, you know, uh, and, and what they're doing is really they're, turning a mind away from looking for unity with one to, hey, just be free and just run around with everybody. Yeah. And I don't know how some people do it with all the diseases and everything going yeah, on out there. Yeah. These people are, are ruthless. They just don't care about their own bodies. Um, and then, you know, when something happens to them, they go, well, how did it happen to me? Or why me? Well, why you? You fell victim to the system. The system has programmed you to think it's okay to run around like this. Versus, you know, trying to focus on yourself and be in love with yourself. And what it has them doing is chasing this level of happiness, looking externally for happiness everywhere they go. Yeah. And they never find it. So they keep jumping from person to person to person to person. You have to be happy in here first. Let's talk Another about thing that. I did, no, actually, yeah. you're probably gone. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So I realized and I was victim with this part as well. I was looking for some level of happiness to come from my second half. Sure in the three prior relationships and it wasn't there. And at the end of the day, I realized, wow, hmm, it's really me that's not happy. Mm. And so even though there are some things that why this didn't work out the way it should have or could have, but at the same time, am I truly really happy with myself? Why am I relying on other people to keep me happy or, or make me happy when in true reality, I should be happy myself. So I took a year off just traveling by myself, going, taking myself on dates, and falling in love with myself. Mm -hmm. I literally fell in love with myself. I would take myself for walks on the beach and stuff. You know, I'd be at, at NBA games videotaping. I took myself on a date, to, you know, <laughs> and posted it online. And uh, taking myself on dates. And then I, I really got happy with myself. And once I got more happy with myself and realized the happiness that was inside of me, then I started working on the part of manifesting someone that would be, you know, a person that would partner with me. But I wouldn't rely on them for any happiness whatsoever. I love that. First, coming from a black man, I really appreciate that you had the time to Thank do you. that and the chance to do that. I think many black men deserve that as well as black women, as well as all of us. But it is something that yeah. we talk about so often in like this big way. We say self-love, love yourself, love yourself. But we don't say what it actually means and it looks like and feels like. Sometimes self-love is a really, yeah. it's a journey. It's a, it's a very yeah. detailed, passionate journey where there are parts of your journey that you can maybe bring up now that you feel like this wasn't so amazing, but I know it was leading to me loving myself. Maybe there was a truth part right. you had to tell yourself. There was a hard lesson you had to learn. There was something you had to forgo. Mm -hmm. And one big thing, you have to forgive yourself. Mm. So a lot of people don't, they never do this and they don't even know it exists. They're asking someone else on the outside, some entity or deity to forgive them and with no knowledge of wherever it's ever been done. And so the best thing you can do is, is forgive yourself. Literally sit down, analyze your life, realize the things that you've done wrong. Because in those other relationships, I wasn't an angel. I wasn't perfect. I'm sure there's things that I've done. And when I analyzed and broke down places where I missed the bar, I was like, hmm, you know what? I did this. I did that. I screwed up here. I screwed up there. And then at the end of the day, I said, you know what? I forgive myself. Yeah. I forgive myself. I absolve myself of anything that I did wrong to hurt anyone or anybody else in a relationship or out of a relationship. And I began to realize that you can forgive yourself. And what you do now, this is the biggest part. When you forgive yourself, you have to now learn from that experience. You can't do it over again. You can't do the same mistake again. Mm -hmm. So you can may forgive yourself multiple times in your lifetime, but it should always be for different situations, 
not the same exact situation because mm-hmm. that means you're not learning your lesson at all. Mm-hmm. You have to take that L as an L for learning, not a loss. Figure out where you went wrong, correct the problem, and don't let it happen again. Billy, what's the last thing you forgave yourself for for the first time? The last thing I forget, the last thing I forgave myself for for the first time was actually not getting my daughter some of the help that she needed. My second oldest daughter, she's now 28 years old. I was just talking to her the other day. Mm-hmm. She had gotten sexually assaulted uh, when she was a 11th grader, 11th grader mm-hmm. uh, in high school. Uh, and that was some years ago now. But, you know, I could still see now knowing a lot more about mental health. I could see where it really has truly uh, affected her long term. Mm-hmm. And at the time, I... I didn't know, I didn't have the knowledge, I would say, or I, I should have done better. I should, I felt like I should have taken her to a psychologist. I think I, I felt like I should have spent more time trying to figure out how to reach her and see if she was really getting true healing. And I see how it has affected her life going forward from that point. It hasn't been exactly the way that uh, I or she, I think, envisioned, but I can see it's all stemming back to that trauma. Mm-hmm. And if I could have, um, if I, you know, if I could have gone back and done it, but now it's too late. So I had to just forgive myself. I held on to that for a long time, mm-hmm. but I just recently forgave myself for that whole thing and, and said, now let me just try to see how much I can pour into her to see what I can do to help her get past that trauma. Thank you for sharing that. Wow. That's definitely mm-hmm. a huge thing as a father. Have you and her been able to have a conversation about, you know, what you wish you knew better and what you'd like to do moving forward. And has she been able to bring, you know, her thoughts on that as well? Yeah, I think she she really, you know, the fact that I brought it up and told her that and expressed it to her, that was part of a healing process as well, because I had never even expressed that. I, I don't think I, I think I, you know, I didn't I missed the boat there. I didn't do a good enough job helping you when that situation happened. Yeah. You know, she went to a movie theater and somebody at the movie theater, a grown man sexually assaulted her. He grabbed her and took her into the back behind one of the curtains mm. and sexually assaulted her at a movie theater with people in it. Mm. And um, I'm actually the one that caught the guy. The cops didn't even catch him. I caught him uh, and then gave the dossier to the cops so they can go pick him up. Mm. But it was a pretty tough situation. But, uh, yeah, just one of the things. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. As a father, I'm sure that is a very deep um serious thing to forgive yourself for, but I'm, I'm very grateful that you did and that you and her were able to have that conversation. I hope that can also heal somebody else. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. We have this segment on the show called Honest Gems, and it's mm. one of those moments, you know, you want to give people the real truth as we are all finding that and seeking. So I'd love to ask you a few honest gems. What sure. don't they tell us about manifestation? What they don't tell you is that... <laughs> You, no matter what you're thinking about, that's what you're going to get back. So if you're thinking about negative thoughts, if you're thinking about uh, something, if you're angry about something or a situation or at people, or you're always focusing on problems and issues nonstop, and you're always talking about negativity at the water cooler at your job, it's always gossip and negativity. You're going to manifest that right back into your life nonstop. So when you, whatever you're focusing on the most, it's what's going to manifest for you. It's just like the Instagram algorithm. If you go to that popular page and tap on one woman or one man with a, you know, a physique, they're going to give you a million physiques a day. There's nothing you can do to stop it. They stole that algorithm from the universe. It's the same exact algorithm. There's nothing different between Instagram popular page and what you're going to get from the universe. If you focus on positive posts and positivity and consciousness, when you open that popular page, the majority of the posts you're going to see are that same thing with the universe, no difference whatsoever. And so what you're focusing on the most, what you're talking about the most, it's what's going to come to you. People thought that manifesting was all about positivity. It works negative and positive. Mm, Well said. What don't they really tell us about quantum entanglement? What they don't tell you about quantum entanglement is you can quantum entangle with uh, people and beings in places that have dark intentions. So if your mind, in, we found out that the human brain is quantum entangling and phase shifting out of the third dimension at different particular times. This is through many, many experiences that they've done in laboratories. And they're saying that the thoughts, your synapses are entangling with other information in the universe. I believe that if you're focused on a lot of dark thoughts all the time and focus on evil or, or things that are low vibrational, that you can quantum entangle with information or, or entities or even beings who have the same synapses or thoughts in other places. And that information can be transferred to you and that it will make you act out things. I think that quantum entanglement is a great thing for manifesting, but also in the wrong mind, 
I think it can create a paradox where someone can become even more evil. Mm. And lastly, what don't they tell us about time? Well, time doesn't even exist. They they want us to believe that time's exi- time exists, but really clocks exist. And so time is a construct, you know, developed by human beings so we can have an arrow to point in so that we can set appointments like me being on this podcast today and so forth and so on uh, so that we can organize what's going on because there's so much, a mul- there's so many multitudes of data that's happening simultaneously. We need this arrow of time to help point us in the right direction. But truthfully, higher than the third dimension, there is no arrow of time. If you were a being in the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh and up, you would see that the past, present, and future happen simultaneously. I know that uh, Einstein hypothesized that the fourth dimension was time, but time is not a dimension. We've discovered that time is simply a construct. The fourth dimension is actually a tesseract, a fourth dimensional cube, and above that is the fifth and, and so forth. And so from these higher dimensions, it would be like looking at somebody inside of a house and seeing them at various different stages in their house, in their life, so in one room, I could be 52-year-old Billy, I can be 19-year-old Billy, I could be 6-year-old Billy, I could be 7-year-old Billy, all in different rooms, but in the same house. And you can observe all those different time spans simultaneously. So in this reality, how do we take that understanding and lead productive lives and lead like, because the word productive has also been completely misconstrued and messed up and now inundated yeah. in a way that makes us feel can be overwhelming in a sense with trying to be productive. Mm -hmm. I think productivity immediately makes me think time. I have to have a schedule. I have to have this, I have to have that, right? As we're opening our pineal gland and we're learning that time is a construct, how do we use these realizations in this reality and, 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 and be fulfilled while still, you know what I'm saying? I guess I'm, I'm even trying to figure out how to ask, but I believe you time is a construct. I've been hearing it. I've been experiencing. And at the same time, I still look at my clock. And I still say, I got to be somewhere at three o'clock. I still I do know. it, right? Yeah, we still have to do that because we're, we're in the third dimension. Right. We're in the third density and we're playing in this matrix, this light, this light matrix. And we, we have to go by the code that allows us to maneuver through the matrix. And that's fine. Mm-hmm. But understanding that I was looking for my little time piece that I had here. I don't see it on the desk right now. But if you look at the sand of an hourglass flowing downward, you'll recognize that everything going to the bottom of that is actually going into the past. That's, those are fleeting moments. Mm. And above that, in the top of the hourglass, is the sand that hasn't fallen yet. That's the future. But the only real moment we can experience is the moment of now, which is the, right in the middle area of that hourglass. As the sand is passing right between the two, that little tiny pinch, that's the moment of now that, ex- that we get to experience moment by moment. And so we have to begin to stop focusing so much on the past because it's gone. The future we can prepare for, but we really have to experience and embrace the moment of now. And some people are too focused on the future. Some people are too focused on the past. There's no balance there. They forgot all about the moment of now. And once you begin to embrace that moment of now, you still want to plan for the future. Stop focusing too much on what you did in the past because you can't get it back. All you can do is take those as lessons to change your future reality, Mm. but embrace that moment of now and time will be a whole new construct for you. I love that. I love that. And I have to ask, based on what I'm experiencing, I don't feel like you hold blame towards family, but you did talk so much about your beginning years and anyone, like you said, would, would hold on to some of that and say like, these are things I had to overcome based on the circumstances I had. How did you learn responsibility? Did, how long did that take? What is your relationship with your family like now? And how did you feel? I mean, I see how you move forward, but how would you suggest somebody else does? Yeah. Well, I started off with responsibility at an early age because when we came to Florida, I'm the oldest child. So I can tell, by the way, I'm the oldest too. (laughs) I was like, I can tell. Yes. You're you're the mom. (laughs) Okay. I was the daddy. Period. Point blank. That's it. That's it. That's it. I would get up, braid my sister's hair. Take her to, you know, take her to the, the, the babysitter around the corner, get my brother dressed, cook the breakfast in the morning. If we had any farina or anything that I could create, you know, anything that I could cook. If we didn't have that, we just scrounge around for whatever we had, whether it was crackers or whatever. But anyway, get to school, right, safely. And um, and then so I was already in that role of maintaining and taking care, get home, do the chores, make sure everybody's got their homework done and pick my sister up, you know, all these things. So 
that was already instilled in me from a very, very young age. And, uh, you know, my, my parents were, they had a very, uh, uh, I don't know what you call it, tumultuous relationship. I would see my mother going after my dad to chop his head off. You know, he'd be high on drugs and alcohol. He'd leave and don't come back for days at a time. He'd, I'm going to get a pack of cigarettes. He wouldn't come back for three months. Mm-hmm. Women would call the house saying that their baby needs diapers, all this crazy stuff. You know, it was just wild. And so um, I never could really understand why she would stay with this guy. Um, I just never, I could never understand it. But for some reason, she never left him. My mother, unfortunately, passed away 14 and a half years ago. My dad passed away now four years ago. Mm -hmm. My mother died from ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. I think the stress just overtook her uh, from the lifestyle she had to live. And then my father, um, he ended up getting beat by police uh, Mm -hmm. and they broke his back and gave him a double concussion. They never fixed the the back and his back started getting worse and worse. The pain was so overwhelming. He became, he was already drinking like two cases of beer, but he went to like six cases of beer a day. And this one day he goes into the hospital and they recognized that the injury had never even been looked at. It was looked at, but never fixed. And he was like one movement away from being paralyzed. Mm -hmm. So they admitted him in the hospital for that. But unfortunately, they didn't give him any alcohol. You can't give an alcohol if no alcohol. So he went into withdrawal symptoms. And then he had uh, what they call a cascade seizure, where he ended up having like 110 seizures in within, uh, I don't know, three or four hours. And it erased his brain. And so he became brain dead. So unfortunately, I had to make the decision as the oldest because my dad was out of it, high and drug. He couldn't make the decision. I had to pull the plug on my mother after they realized she was brain dead, you know, after she, her, she the ALS took her. And then I had to make the same decision in the same hospital, same, uh, what do you call that room that they put you in, that um, that room where, you know, you're about to go, uh, yeah, critical care critical or whatever care. it is. But I had to make the same decision for him mm-hmm. where uh, they pulled the plug on him as well. After several more MRIs and brain scans and CT scans and everything else, I realized he had, he was gone. It was, it was over a week. So they just unplugged him from the life support and then he eventually passed away. But but other the other family members, I don't really communicate too much with a lot of family, um, just because I was there was always a lot of turmoil and there was a whole a lot of drama and and you know when you go to see them, and one one year I just said to myself, you know, why do I keep putting myself through this drama and this stress? So I just stopped going around. I would show up every now and then to say hi and show my respects. I still love them, but I disconnected myself significantly from hanging out with a lot of family. And once I did that, my life became so much more peaceful. Mm. What a story, Billy. Yeah. What a story indeed. Thank you so much for sharing and for making the choice to shine your light um, very bright and very just you're just very present to your experiences. Even as you were talking, you know, that that those are very heavy stories of very heavy experiences. Yeah. And I just I'm so grateful that you it's hard to tell somebody I'm grateful you went through them, but I'm, I'm grateful to see how they did not break you. That is what I'm grateful for. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Billy Carson, everyone. Thanks so much for being on the Human Human podcast. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is amazing. This is amazing. You're definitely going to be back for part two. You guys, make sure you check out Billy Carson hey. on Forbidden Knowledge. Um, you also have your own TV network. Is there anywhere you want to lead our guests to to make sure they continue staying in touch with you? Yeah, sure. Go to 4BK with the number 4, 4BK.TV and get a free trial. And there's over 6,000 shows there. My Egyptian Mystery School is the number one watched series on the TV network. Amazing. Amazing. Again, Billy Carson, everyone. If you want to, you can easily check it out on YouTube, but please start with getting some new books, getting some new ways of understanding your pineal gland, expanding your pineal gland, because you deserve that level of consciousness. You deserve that level of light. We all deserve that together. So again, I hope you guys check that out. And thanks for listening to Human Human.